Yeah, and it's me again. And Lee Wave topics. So we'll look at uh, what is Lee Wave, basic elements required for Lee Wave to occur, structure of Lee Wave systems, generalisation, uh, indicators of recognising Lee Wave, so before flight, so you're going, you know, is it there or not? Or is it a possibility of it? Different methods of contact in the Lee Wave. Tips of staying in the Lee Wave once you've got it, got into it, because the easiest thing is to lose it as soon as you found it. And atmospheric stability details that's required for it, not specifically in cover, because you can spend ages doing that side of things and you know, there's all sorts of mathematical formulas and I've seen some papers and books on it and, and you go, well, it's gone over the top of my head, you know, you can get really involved in the mathematics behind it and try to calculate what's going on. I just, I just figured it was going to fly if it works, it works, if it doesn't, it doesn't. So, so it's a phenomenon that occurs in the lay of the mountains. Uh, ridge, lift, conversely, is, is directly associated with the ridge, and it's on the upland side of the ridge. This stuff happens on the downwind side. It's a vertical displacement of air with the horizontal airflow consisting of downward and upward motion within the horizontal flow. So it actually goes down to start with, and then it goes up as a result of the, the stability of the air. So pattern of known is a wave, and we'll see the diagram on another slide on what's involved with the typical, well the, the classic wave, a lot of people would have seen it, it's uh, one that was done by Reichman. So that's on the terms, you've got a generator, which is the mountain range, or the source where it comes from. Wavelength, so everyone's familiar what a wavelength is, so if one part of the, with a wave cycle, wherever you might be, where it starts, goes through the complete cycle, and that is known as our wavelength then. So we've got like peak to peak of the waves, or the trough to trough, or the, the starting point where it starts to go up. The amplitude of the wave, so it's effectively like the how much height we've got per the length. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of we've got a lot of amplitude. We basically can get relatively strong lift in that case. If you've got not a lot of amplitude, <coughs> um, there's the generally the the strength isn't that uh, isn't that high. But the ability to get like strong climbs in wave. I've heard of climbs of in the order of up to 30 knots lift in wave. You're not going to get that in any thermals at all, or if you did get in the thermal, probably rip your wings off sort of thing, but it's, the, the lift is smooth in, within the wave. So if we've got something with the phase or the resonance re reinforcement of the wave uh, associated with downwind uh, additional mountain ranges and if they happen to be in or out of phase with the, the wave and there's things to consider with that. Uh, the wave, in, we've got primary wave, secondary and tertiary wave, so once the wave's gone up, so it's kind of, we've got a primary, comes down again up, we've got a secondary, down up, and again next time it goes up it happens to do it again, that's a tertiary and then whatever they call it after that, but that's the, the sort of uh, scenario like, like that. Um, I think sometimes the waves are flown in Bunyan there would have been like six or seven waves back from the main range and you jump up the waves progressively going forward. They're good fun doing that. Um, Do they get higher as you get them? Uh, I've or usually found I haven't got much higher <coughs> until I've got to the primary wave. Each of the other waves usually peter out about the same sort of height, mm -hmm. I've typically found. Sometimes the strength gets a bit more, but the, the height of the wave hasn't been quite as much, but then in, in the primaries, you go. But sometimes, uh, depends on how it goes in phase, you can be quite a few waves down, and it happens to be the right phasing occurring, and it's got that resonance, which we'll find out later, mm -hmm. you that higher. you can go even higher there, and it's a really strong lift there. Uh, the lamina in the wave, we things are it's layered, it's laminate, smooth. It's 
the area is, is smooth and you've got the under laminar layer which is rough. Uh, it can be cobblestone sort of effect or just a little bit bumpy or you can be a lot being thrown into a mix master. It's just sort of, you know, it goes from, and you will find it can go from one extreme to the other or you can go from laminar to all of a sudden <coughs> shaking and all hell breaks loose. And under in within the under laminar layer, you've got the rotor, and there's uh, rotor Q, cumulus. Uh, the cumulus may or may not be present. If it is present, it makes life a lot easier. And you'll see some pictures I've taken of that later on. A lenticular cloud, which is within the laminar region, and that may or may not be present. Most of my wave flights have been without lenies. Uh, my, my diamond height climb actually did that with. Uh, I was lucky enough I had rotor Q plus lenticular and the spot that I went to was a Lenny was forming well before I got up into the main waves and I noticed the cloud there even before it took off and I thought I'm going to go that way if I get the chance I'm going there because something's making that happen and if that's happening there and nowhere else then that's got to be the better bit of air and also with the rotors the rotor Q, the deeper bits of cloud in depth what gives you higher cloud tops is usually the best amplitude of wave because the amplitude in that spot is creating that deeper rotor. So the, the climate is your best climate in front of that. So there's, there's lots of things that you're looking for. It's a, it's a different dynamic to thermal flying but it's just as much fun I think as it's another dimension to soaring. And then you've got the, the phone, uh, there's a gap, and there's also a thing known as a wind. We generally don't notice the wind so much here, but like in southern Germany, if they've got like a, uh, coming from the south or in, the, in France, they've got like the mistral, the mistral wind, that's a dry wind. And in southern Germany, if they've got a southerly that comes up and they've got the, you know, the waders on from the, from the Alps the other way, and they call it, you know, they usually, people say they go nuts with the mistral, not the mistral, the, the, the foam wind. Um, but yeah, it's a drier air. I mean, we, we, we used to dry air here, but Europeans aren't so much. So anyway, there, there are various effects there. And we'll have a look at uh, things that are needed there. So obviously the mountain range, the generator, the higher usually better. Uh, you only got something a few hundred feet high. Actually, can generate wave, but it's not as likely to something that's you know, tens of thousands of feet high can have a better chance of setting a wave up because it's going through greater layers of the atmosphere. Um, the lee side's the important bit, in my view, uh, because you can even get the lee wave from a, a plateau drop off. So it's not necessarily the upwind side that's doing it, it can have an effect, it's the downwind bit where it drops off and the air then descends. And because of the stability of the air, it actually wants to go back where it came from. But because the inertia, it overshoots and it goes past. And that's why you end up setting a, that's, 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 that's the basics of setting a wave. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we need is wind increase, uh, increasing uh, speed with altitude and the wind is ideally, so if this table here was the range, ideally sort of at 90 degrees to that because that gives you the best chance of the best wave, it can be up to 45 degrees from to that but at the 90 degrees is, is the, the optimal. And you want a stable layer of air sandwiched between less stable layers above and below. Uh, Richard Gatenbeek mentioned one time, was actually a good analogy of the stability effects, just quickly. You imagine having some, I'll we'll just quickly draw up here, some springs. So you've got like a, a couple of soft springs above and below. And then you imagine sort of like a, a more of a heavy duty, uh, oh, this one here, you know, a real heavy duty spring. 
and you give that a flick, the heavy duty spring is going to the heavy duty spring is going to stay keep its shape. So imagine that's moving up and down a lot, and these lighter springs, because they're stay uh, uh, unsta more unstable air, allow that heavy spring to float within those spaces then. So that air is actually going to be moving up and down, so that's going to give you your maximum amplitude or your, your strength, and it'll die off there, and usually so your rotor area might be within this zone here. Um, just a, like a, a quicker, you know, an easier way to try and sort of explain the effect of how the how the wave works without going into the detail too much. Again, it's it's quite a detailed subject, but we won't get too complex. Otherwise, it'll you know, go over the over the top. Uh, yeah, it's quite a detailed subject. The other thing there, be with the sailplane equipped with oxygen or be square. <laughs> Get up there, give it a go. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of people that turn up, for instance, to the Bunyan Wave Camp, they don't have oxygen in their glider, and you get to 10,000 feet, and just when the fun's really starting, they're going to call it quits. Uh, there's nothing more aggravating than that, watching somebody at 20,000 feet speck above you. <laughs> And plus in 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 wave. So uh, other things. What's neat? All right. Here's some a few little diagrams here. This is out of um, uh, Reichman. So it's a, that one's a sort of size so short, a short thing. I would think it's, it doesn't really matter so much what happens on the upwind side. So much it's actually the the downwind bit because I've actually even seen waves form. We've had a, had a valley, and there's an area near Bunyan they call Motor Lake, and they're trying to figure what triggers the wave there. But it's part of the um, uh, Murrumbidgee River. There's a ravine that's further to the west out there, in particular, and that happens to be in some, a lot of times in phase with the other waves that come off the main range and it gets into that ravine from the Murrumbidgee River, so the air flows down and then back up again, and that's actually set off that, the wave there as well. And you get quite often good wave just in that same spot all the time. So I reckon it's in that lee. Effectively there, it does that sort of thing like that, so the air flying into that valley and goes up, and then the other side it really sets off a good wave, so that Mother Lake spot's about there, but this is sort of up sort of more like high ground here, and that's high ground there, and you've just got that valley in there, so it sort of sets off a, a wave that way. Uh, uh, that one's high and long, and yeah, there's all sorts of factors that affect it. As far as when we do wave flying, like the Flinders, the Elders by far is probably the best uh, wave source. You can get it off the chase range in the lead as well, and also off the pound, you can get the uh, the waves, so that it, they're all good sources, um, and yeah, there's plenty of people around here that know which, when it's going and if it is. And uh, generally, most instructors know and coaches go up there. They'll if it's on, better help you out with that. Okay, this <coughs> one's from Reichman as well. That's there's a detail of stability there. Here's your temperature profile here, so I've got like an isothermal layer here. And this is the wind velocity, so as we're going without, increase with altitude, uh, so you can see the wind strength picking up as we go higher. And this is our, sort of our wave generator here, mountain. Uh, out to the upwind side, you can have a lot of, lot of cloud, even rain. I've actually seen snow and snow drift coming out the back here. In one of the photos you'll see later on about snow drift. And the first part of the wave is the air's actually going down. And then it goes up. So if you go too far past it, you'd be flying in sync again. And here we've got our rotor, under laminar layer. Now this one here happens to be in phase pretty well. This one has an increase in strength. I'd probably sort of think otherwise that could even be a stronger wave, quite potentially, in this location 
if it's in phase rather than than that sort of scenario here. Uh, but a lot of it is, there's so many things that are going on. It's it's not a uh, an easy thing to to really determine. But here's our lenticular clouds: primary wave, secondary wave, tertiary, rotor cue. As it shows there, the air is all over the place. That can be happening like that. That can go down to ground level. We can get wind reversals. And the other thing with wave, if you've got the rotor near the airfield, can give you, some people say, oh, but there's no wind. There won't be any wave. Sometimes the wind can be even going sideways at 90 degrees to what's happening up above. But all of this is happening above you. Even, you know, 500 feet above, there's a heap of wind going on, and that sets the wave that sets the wave off, so it's not always a good indicator of what's happening on the surface to what's happening aloft. So here we've got our best uh, climb strengths and then it progressively dies off. Also, primary tends to have a bit more of a tilt into when as you go further back in the wave systems, so they tend to stand more upright. Then. Uh, that's the main thing here, because you can see here your wave length is actually longer at altitude than it is down lower, and that's got the, the tilt on there. So when you're climbing, you might have to go forwards in the wave, and you may even well be over the, the generator by the time you've climbed up. Um, any questions on that so far? We'll have a look about getting in later on, but there's some techniques and tips about getting in. I'd suggest earlier on, where I've got the cursor here, if it's best that you get the tuggy to tow you upwind of the cloud and in that sort of spot there it'll go smooth and all of a sudden if the wave's there the climb rate you'll probably find will be pegged and you can ping off and you're just climbing, starting to climb really well and you can get off rather than trying to work this stuff down here because you may not be able to climb up in the rotor and work up into the, the wave itself that's more of an experience once you've done a bit of this sort of stuff. You can actually do it, but it's better to make sure you get yourself in there and then up and climbing. In the middle of the day, this height here is usually at the highest in the afternoon. In the mornings, it's down lower. And it can make four or five, six thousand foot difference over the course of the day. What the height of the rotor? Yep. Um, the last wave flight I did at Bunyan, um, the rotor was, Q was about sort of initially six, six and a half thousand feet and I missed out and I ended up coming down quite, quite a long way, almost landed and then slowly worked my way up in the rotor, it was really r the roughest thermals I've ever worked and I didn't have any more rotor Q afterwards but it was still rough at 10,000 feet before getting into the wave. So it went up from six and a half thousand feet to 10,000 in a couple of hours. So that the warming of the day brings your tops of the, the under lamina upwards. The wave still can be on, but it's, it just makes it harder to get in. So if you didn't have those Lenny, Lenny clouds up there, if, if you don't have if you those, don't see that, you got no and you don't have on. those... Even if you had the cues, they could be formed from anything, pretty much, couldn't they? They could be thermals or whatever. But it, well, anyway, if, yeah. if there's no clouds, how do you know there's way that you don't? Yeah. Yep. Um, it's local knowledge, isn't it? Work it out. <laughs> there, is, there is a bit of local knowledge. There's a bit of people, let's say, Snapper going up and trying something out. And, Boy, it's working here. Yeah. Um, it really does help sometimes when you... You know, sometimes I've just seen, like, this lenticular forming there. We had one year at the Flinders we were going to get ready to fly this when we had the Janus and we were going to rig over at uh, uh, Warnsley Park. It was easterly blown initially and then at nine, I think Brent you were there, and then it, oh, it might have been, um, and then it went to a westerly at nine o'clock, real fast, real hard, 20 knots, westerly going. And then almost like within seconds that lenticular formed, it was there from 9 o'clock in the morning. We rigged the Janus eventually at 1 o'clock and put the oxy system in. And there was one time when Gabby went up there and he said, oh, the lenticular dis disappeared. Oh, there's no point putting it in now because the lenny's gone, there won't be a wave anymore. Oh, don't worry, there will be. We got up to 18,000 feet that day. So, um, 
Frank, I had an example. I was in New Zealand climbing up in the rover, pushed out in front, was 26 knots wind. I got up in front and started climbing up from the clouds and I hit 90 knots. Yep. And I finished up back inside the lenticular. This, this here, I found one of the climbs I had at the Flinders, I was thermally underneath the cloud and I used my collar bite to work out the wind. And before that I was ridge soaring and Andrew said the wind he'd measured was 30 knots on the ridge. Mm. Uh, and then I got underneath in this rotor area and I only had like about 15 knots. And I was thinking, oh no, I don't have the wind gradient there. Oh, the wave's not going to work. And I thought, ah, oh, stuff it. I just went out the front of that cloud and got the edge there and bang, 10 knots of lift in, in wave. So the, in this area here, you imagine like that, if you, if you got out of phase where it was, the ridge was about like that, at the chase range, and like that was the elders, and on the chase where Andrew was and I was ridge soaring, that wind is actually funneling down so it's even stronger there. So this layer here, you get really strong surface winds, and here the winds can back off, can be even very light wind here, or even wind direction reversal. So that area's been compressed, and then all of that wind, you can call it, is spread out over a large area. So the, it drops off and it speeds up and drops off. So it's not always an indication of what the general wind is like if you're here, flying underneath that. But these clouds are basically like parallel the generator. Rather than you'd have a cloud streak that's up and down wind. And if that is happening, it's probably not going to be a wave system. If it's sort of building up and then dying off, and that spot sitting in, in the same spot that could be a wave, but it's generally rotor cues across mm -hmm. wind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this cloud is, you can see it's moving, but it's on the stationary spot over the ground. It's, it's continuously forming upwind and it's dissipating downwind. So anyway, we'll, we'll uh, move along on that. In uh, Marimut, uh, just come back to that diagram if you can. The, um, uh, just checking out that picture now. The I think at Marima the quite often the, the secondary what's labelled as the secondary wave there is the is where you get dropped off on your um, on the toe. And you can ridge saw that mm. second mountain. Um, and there's actually a there's actually a rotor there as well. I don't know why it's not drawn in that in that picture, but there's actually a rotor um, associated with that secondary wave. Mm. And quite often you would ridge saw the mountain, go above the mountain, drive forward into the under the queue, which was obviously rotor queue because it was turning around and dissipating. And you get bounced around, you do some thermaling, and you just keep move, pushing forward. And then eventually you get into the, the wave itself and you go up. So you can pretty well go from ridge soaring at a very low altitude, and the next thing you're into the wave and going up. And I think yeah. that's. And the other point there is you can actually end up with that wave dumping on that second ridge as well. So sometimes the ridge doesn't work yeah. because that's the down part of the wave um, yeah, if it's moved um, slightly. So the, um, but if, when it is in sync, yeah. uh, it's organised and it goes up like that. You, you get that effect at, that, at the Flinders yeah. that Tom Lux described at the, uh, just near the airfield. The, it was totally out of phase there. And there's a whole bunch of others that tried to get in the wave earlier on that day and uh, they weren't successful because they were trying it near the airfield. What I did is I then ridge soared further down the chase range towards where the, the beam roughly with the Morellana Scenic Drive uh, and the main road meet and I'd get to that point there. There was road acute then so I thermaled up as much as I could underneath that, punched out but a number of times even in the blue. Same spot, you get to that Morellana Scenic Drive intersection with the main road and if it isn't working it's probably not going to work, but you get as much height, you work rotors and do rotor walk, we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a little while. And the thing is, I've, I've worked in off the chase range into a wave and had a low point of 900 feet, 900 feet above yeah. ground on the ridge, and then climbed in, went to 16 and a half, yeah. so that was, that was a good fight. Mm. And, and even last Black Springs, the last Black Springs camp, exactly what you're talking about, how the ridge was it must have been dumping on top of the ridge, mm. and someone went up before us. And they said the ridge wasn't working, or that looked like the wind should be, you know, sh looked like the, yeah. the ridge should have been working. And I went up on tow with uh, Ian Phil, and as we as we we towed along the ridge, and you could see that just we weren't climbing very well. We went out through the middle, and it looked like we we're climbing better. 
And as we came around, still seeing dead, and so I got the tuggy to take us back into the middle, and we got off and we got straight into wave, and mm -hmm. we went to uh, 5,000, it was only 5,000 feet mm -hmm. high we got to, but you know, that was the middle of winter, June, got to mm -hmm. 5,000 feet in wave, just there, but the ridge was definitely not working. We, were, we descended back down, went back down on the ridge, and the ridge was still very, you know, it wasn't yeah. working. So. Mm -hmm. It's probably slightly off topic because you're talking about the ridge flying, but quite often when you fly across country, you fly through an area that seems to be better than it should be, and then you go through an area that's worse than it should be, and that's just wave influence. It's not mm. this sort of wave where it's very definite, but, mm. but you can just get wave just on a, a normal cross country day. Mm. And sometimes it's really hard to pick and understand how that's happening. It's, it's a subtle effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So I've got uh, convection and lee wave times of the year for generally the classic way of flying in Australia is the winter period, including sort of like late autumn, early spring. Um, you can get it in summer, but it's less likely to occur. Um, yeah, but we're, we've got, uh, you know, our mountains aren't as big as say like the Andes, Rockies, the, you know, New Zealand Alps produce waves all, all year round. And um, yeah, I've done wave flying there and, you know, uh, around New Year in, in New Zealand and it was going gangbusters, so you wouldn't be doing that in Australia at all. What about the high country in North East Victoria around Hotham and the nah, same. Same, same, same. Yeah. The, the, the mountains here, like, uh, oh, let's say they're reasonably high, but they're pimples compared to... Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, but you still get a reasonable amount of wave. It, it, it gives a wave influence on things, but it's not the, the classic waves that yeah. we can generally try and fly. Um, North East Victoria doesn't have a lot of very long ridge lines. So okay. It tends to be isolated mountains yeah. next to it, near each other. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, it's, there's, there's, it's hard for the, the wave to actually set up because if uh, you get a bit of something here, then all of a sudden there's nothing yeah. because the, the mountain's a bit further yeah. back or a bit it's further forward. So yeah. it's, uh, it's very hard to, to pick this. You can get a localised bit, mm -hmm. uh, but not a lot where you, you know, like Frank was talking about there, with, with running a long, 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 a long line. Okay. You know, you've got sort of, you'll see once you get like to the, up to the Flinders and have a good look around there, you can then get an understanding of, that gives you better, more, a lot more of a classic sort of, but still localised, uh, but like New Zealand, the, the land of the long white cloud mm -hmm. is the wave system. Yeah. And, it, you know, you can run the country They've had, you know, from almost, you know, one end of the, to New Zealand up to the other end, you know, under the right conditions of flying yeah. waves. They've done some, you know, over 2,000 kilometre mm. flights done there, so. Um, so some of the pre-flight indicators of Lee Wave, uh, you look at the synoptic information, uh, you know, temp trace, wind data, I mean, also since I've uh, you know, done this one as well, you can use things like, um, the various uh, uh, soaring software around the place to try and uh, analyze it, like you know, XE skies, anything that does have a um, uh, forecast sort of temp trace with winds on it, that sort of thing like that. But like the XE skies, you can pinpoint a spot and give you the wind data and that sort of stuff, modeling over the next few days. And uh, Brian used that uh, number of days out from one day a big dark bunion and it was bang on uh, even a few days out within to about half an hour of when the wave was going to start. So we got ourselves ready, made sure we were ready to go, I hopped in the glider. And when I took off there wasn't that much wind but later on it really came up, went up to 35 knots and they called off, called off launching after that so, okay. so it gives you, you know, an idea of what's, what's going on. Uh, if there's rotor Q and or Lenny's, uh, might, might not be present. The, the rotor Q isn't always obvious, even at the number of times I've been to wave camps, and you know, probably one of Brenton's first wave flights he had up there, he took Ali up for a, for a flight in the twin. I woke up in the morning there and said, oh, yeah, beauty, the wave's on. You know, and I was running around getting ready, and I saw Brenton, I said, Brenton, grab Ali, get the twin, go for a wave flight. And it, and it was it was dead obvious what was happening. I could see all the clouds. Some people are going, standing around scratching their head and wondering what's going on. And you know, it's once you've once you've got it sussed out, 
take some mental snapshots of what's going on of the cloud formations and then look at it sort of you know, fairly close, get another five minutes, another five minutes, and if the picture's sort of kind of the same, and it could be wave. But you have to think, what's the generator, and where, where the wind direction's likely to be? Look at the synoptics, and you understand what's going on with the winds, potentially. You can suss out what's going on, so that that mental time lapse. And you got with the clouds, and there's been a number of times I've been to wave camp, so I thought, yeah, waves on up there, and uh, even the locals think, no, nah, no, nah, nah, no wave, and yep, yeah, it's there. Something's causing those clouds to sit at a particular spot. They don't do it for the fun of it. It's something's making it happen. So the surface wind not always a good indicator. Uh, what's happening above? So we consider it the, the items above. Uh, other pre-flight. Uh, understanding what might be the generator and where the lift zones might be. Say if you've been lured into what we call a Clayton's wave, everyone knows what the Clayton's is, it's the wave when you're not having a wave. It looks like up there, there's, I've seen somebody take a, t almost a 10,000 foot aero tow at the Flinders, chasing a wave, and been up there, you know, I don't know, the tow time's 20 minutes or some 20, 25 minute tow time, good fun for the tuggy, <laughs> but almost beat the tug back down because nothing's happening up there. And I thought, oh, they see this cloud up there and the cloud's actually drifting along. And it's just happened to be a shear that's working at the same time that when they're launched and by the time they get up there, it's disappeared. You know, so, oh, they wanted to go and do it, so I thought, oh, well, you can empty your wallet, I'm not paying for it, so. Um, so you get advice from other experienced pilots on the ground, local knowledge, and even better, reliable reports from others flying gliders of what's happening up there. Um, yeah. Um, so identifying. Ten minutes, Frank. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so parcel there going from lift. Uh, and then drift back into the sink as, as the as it drifts with the wind. So if you if you like got a got a got a thermal, we're turning around, drifting back, and as we go each time we go further back, the sink's getting worse. Or and the lift is on more so on the upwind side. So that's that's a possible indication of wave. So we're thermaling, can have to keep recentering into wind. And stronger and lift sink stronger the downwind side of circling. Best ways uh, we have a look straight from straight in the wave from your launch method typically. If you've got the ridge like um, uh, Terry's mentioning, the generator, and one method's locked down, then on the downwind side to the primary wave. So you've just got a mountain, you ridge saw the mountain and then over the back of the mountain and then get into the wave. So that's one way of doing it. Of course the strongest sink is just behind the mountain. So what they do is they travel warp speed, once they get over the top, they ridge saw it as high as they can and over the back and they go really fast and as soon as the barrier comes off the bottom stop, they do a chandelle into wind. Because if you wait till it comes off the bottom stop, you've gone past the, the next bit of lift and you're in the next lot of sink and you're going to outland probably a few seconds later. So it's really just you're plummeting down the other side. It always surprised me how close to the back of the mountain the lift is. Yeah. Um, I've never understood how the air can, the pressure etc can get down and back up again at a very high rate of knots so close to the mountain. It's almost like you're touching the back of the mountain. So you do have to be, actually disappear over the back and are plummeting. You do need to be prepared to turn really, really quickly because uh, uh, you'll hit the lift pretty quickly and you need to be in it. Not that the strength says going past it. Yeah. And, and uh, over the total length, you think about the glider's got a sink rate, right? So your actual band that you can be flying in, in rising air is a very small percentage of the total wave system mm -hmm. along across. The, the wavelength itself. There's obviously bits of worse than others. 
and other ways uh, Lee Ridge lift. So a ridge that's in the lee of the generator. Uh, Terry mentioned there before, actually this one, and then uh, either the primary, secondary or tertiary. Uh, running that ridge uh, diagonal until it's in phase. So the chase range, or will paint a pound ridge soaring uh, with the oldest wave in, at the Flinders, um, because so like the chase range this is a diagonal to the primary or the generator, which is the elders, and depends on how strong the wind is. Sometimes it can be right in phase with the chase range southern end. Other times it's it's usually a bit further out, so you can ridge saw along there, climb up, and then head up into the wave, and you're in the primary and up the go. So there's a couple of us that have done diamond climbs there of over 16, 404 feet. Uh, Matt Scudder's got his diamond there and um, already had mine, but I've done a diamond on high climb at the Flinders as well. So. And uh, this year. Yeah. the other one. <laughs> uh, what day? <laughs> is uh, at, uh, at Marama to the south of Marama, there's a spot there called Hugo's Elevator. And that's quite a, a so famous or again. notorious spot, whichever way you want to call it. And the wind sort of goes into, there's a couple of ridges that go in there, but it's sort of a bit of a funnel sort of area where it, all the winds sort of converge into that spot. And it just, there's air, a jet of air that shoots up there and you get into Hugo's elevator and you get in that spot and there's usually a wave sitting yeah. above the elevator there and up you go. I, I, got, I got close to the elevator and we were just, we just going up like a rocket. So, uh, uh, we'll see. If you know the experience, some tips you can have. Aero tow available, suggest the following. Um, the wave sites over the tuggies uh, usually know where to tow you, and if you haven't done it before, um, you can. Um, You get towed uh, where others have been before. Usually best not to be the first bunny up there if you haven't done it before. And let them know that you're new to it and just ask them to tow you into the wave. Then once you're in it, it's magic ride then. And a lot of people skimp on the launch. My advice that I had when I did my diamond height climb at Bunyan, I was talking to Dave Peach and to Malcolm Ferguson, um, and they both said to me, you're here to do some wave flying if you get your diamond beauty, but get towed up into the wave. Don't skimp on it. If it works out, you get your height gain, you get your height gain. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But if you've gone up there and then flop out and come back down on the ground, because you've haven't gone up high enough. Because you're trying to work out how to get from the rotor under lamina into the wave is pretty hard. But it's, it's a thing to try and master later. And, um, yeah, so getting towed in the lamina is the most reliable way. Check now on there. Rotor thermals, probably uh, rotor walk. It might be a subject most of you going up to the Flinders. We might have a bit more of a chat about it up there because time's sort of marching on now. It's a bit of an involved subject, but it's it's an interesting one. So we can have a bit more of a. So once you're in the wave, that. is it hard to stay in it, or you just just got to go? Don't go it, too far forward. It's you know? it's Turn a back. it's a it's a different mindset. I'll, I'll explain a few things in here as we go, but it's a different sort of mindset to thermal flying. Um, but the rotor walking is probably most of you haven't done it. Uh, general way of flying, so we won't worry about so much the rotor walk. If we do it, your instructor or coach will work out how to do that for now because it's it's a little bit of a art, so to speak. Um, one term that uh, again, Wills has always keep saying driving home is to uh, look out for the whiskers. So it's the little whiskers of cloud that start forming. If they're out upwind of you, what, go for the whiskers. Watch out the whiskers up there. You have to keep moving up, because otherwise, if you don't do that, you, you're continually drifting back. And you're probably too far back then. Uh, yeah, we'll, 
we won't go over that now because we don't we're just a bit shy on time on things. Um, so now now in the so we'll find the LV might have been rough before all of a sudden it's smooth and if the vario's up, we're in the wave. We can afford to maybe explore around a little bit there, but we're in wave. Well, it's, I reckon it's smoother than sitting here in this chair because mm. the ground is moving. You know, little earthquakes or tremors yeah. and stuff like that or whatever. It's seriously smoother being it's up in the, in the glider and the wave. I reckon yeah. everyone, I know this, it's, you know, once I've said it to somebody and they said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it was real smooth up there. It's just freaky smooth. Um, uh, yeah, so I've been in the lift. Now it's easy to find yourself out of the lift. So if you're not climbing, first off, always go for uh, If you've got rotor cue or any lemmings like that, <laughs> look for them. And if they're forming in front of you, just move forwards. Don't get mistaken by another wave band that's way, way out in front of you because that can be the next, if you're on the secondary wave and that's the primary rotor, <laughs> you're not going to make it up to those um, uh, rotor queue up there, you probably outland before you get there. Um, but obviously clouds ne nearby, but uh, the, the, there's a tendency to drift back and that'll get you in the sink or reduce lift then. So you always need to consider moving forward first off. And going for height gain, straight off toe, you'll need to notch. You, uh, well, not necessarily straight off toe, but you'll need to get a notch or descent, and then, then you can do your subsequent climb. If you just continue to climb, so I'm on toe, I've got toe in the way, release, keep climbing, there's no notch now, I've just got, I've got a CU trace on here. We'll have a quick look at that in, in a moment. If there's no notch on there to show that you've actually descended, the official observer can't give you a height gain at all because there's no evidence of you, yeah, where did you get off toe? Mm -hmm. You know, even if you say that, oh, in the tuggy, oh, I released him, or he got, got off at X point, no, it's not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. So Frank, a uh, difficult one now, so I guess, but like, what's the width of the lift band? You know, that, is it, that can, is it typically quite narrow? Or it, it, can, it can vary. Uh, I've, I've got some photos, actually. I'm not sure the, well, the photos didn't come up. Hmm, that's funny, because I had some photos in the slide. I must have skipped past them. No, we'll have a look now in a moment. Hopefully they're there. there. Mm. I'll have to have a look there. Um, yeah, the width can be several hundred metres of the band itself. The best bit can be only a hundred or so metres in block depth mm -hmm. of the the uh, the wave system. And I've seen wavelengths up to 15 kilometres wavelength and like the left band probably two, three, four kilometres deep. But the, the, best, bit, uh, the best bit is probably within a, a half a kilometre mm, of that. Mm. So it's a fairly narrow band. That's where you get the really, really good stuff. Uh, it's, it's the where the maximum rate of change occurs in the wave itself mm. is where the best lift is. Um, so there's air, air breaking down, you can do that, but you can drop out of the wave and you might have to relight because I think that's not the best way of doing it, I think. Uh, is then the other ways to speed up and then slow down so you can get your notch doing that. You just be careful, don't exceed rough airspeed. Because if you go down below in the under laminar layer and all of a sudden hit the rotor and you're doing V&E, uh, you can probably bust your glider and yourself doing that. So max rough airspeed is probably, unless you know where the, where the bottom of the rotor is likely to be, certainly early on, it, you probably might not be aware of that. So that's a thing there. That Tecmax uh, is likely, less likely to fly out of the wave but again, you don't do that flying downwind. Because if you're doing it downwind notch, yeah, whoops, you missed that wave system and you're off into the next and you probably, by the time you get in the lift, 
if you do, you're going to be below your notch anyway. So the idea of the notch is to be your low point. But first make sure you're established in it. Don't go and notch it and then go, shit, there wasn't any lift there anyway, and I'm still going <laughs> down. <laughs> so... A new notch. <laughs> yeah, a new, a new low point. Uh, so establishing a lee wave, get staying in it. Uh, get references to where you are with ground features. It's basically stationary over the ground. If the wind speed changes, the uh, position of the wave can change, but it doesn't change that rapidly, typically. Uh, no, the cloud is around you and not to drift back into the clouds. Like Brian was saying it's quite easy to go, you're in there all of a sudden the wind speed increases and you haven't allowed for it and then you drift them back into the cloud then. You could get a sudden change, I was 26 knots and then hit 90 knots just so I got a bit higher. I put the nose down, I finished up inside the cloud and couldn't see anything. Yep. I flew around inside the cloud for a bit more from air breaks and came out the bottom. I didn't lose it. Hmm. Gavin said, oh what are you doing? I said, I can't do anything, I'm just going to get out of it. Wind speed should increase with altitude, and this is a common way of losing contact with the wave. Prime example, Brian just pointed out there. Be aware, indicated airspeed uh, is um, less than the the, uh, the true airspeed, and gets worse the higher you go, because your air density reduces. Your airspeed indicator is reading the indicated, or well, you, you get the indicated effect rather than the actual TAS, so... And that's quite significant, isn't it? It's not yep. 2%, I mean it can be 30%. Uh, so you must refer to your maximum V&E placard versus altitude in the glider, so they've got them in, have a look at the glider and you know, as you go up, what's, what's your change in V&E then? So the disc is an example from surface to 13,000 feet, it's 135 knots, and at 25,000 feet, it's 111 knots. And there's bits in between and above, but that just gives you an example. Okay, sending. Um, the wind strength will play an important part of the wave, how you work it. Um, you need to move forward to a relative point over the ground quite often. Uh, primary wave can tilt, as we'd seen before, and so Frank, you've got two or three minutes. So, yep. what's the most important thing you want to show? Okay, I'll we'll just remember your yeah, altimeter alt subscale. Flying over ten thousand feet, set that. Give it a go. So we can do it, you know, we can have it at Gawler, in an easterly, southeasterly, uh, in a northwesterly off the hummocks, Flinders is a spot, Grampians is another spot you go away flying, uh, Bunyan's a good spot, Stirling's, there's quite a few places you can do it, and then overseas, it's a whole bunch of places. Common errors, get off too early. Um, now unless you know the rotor walk, not allowing for drift, wind and ground features, not observing the clouds, and not notching it. Alright, on those. Alright, what I'll do is I'll just scroll through. I reckon. Well, something must have happened here. Uh, yeah, here we go. Good shot there. See that temperature there? Minus 32.5. The altitude. See that one there? It's subscale. You know, the hundreds of uh, the thousands of feet and the hundreds of feet coming up to 24,500 feet. Mm -hmm. I can't see much out the front. No, it's, hazy, <laughs> isn't it? It's hazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can't need oxygen, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll just have a look to see what. Oh, hang on. Okay, uh, can't slide. I don't know what happened to 
those photos or they didn't come up. So that spans a road queue. The wavelength's about 15k near Amarama, New Zealand. That's about 15,000 feet. So from this start of this cloud bit to see there to there, uh, Gavin Wills measured was about 15 kilometres wavelength we had there. And I took this one, it's about 20,000 feet. That's, that's the Kosciuszko sort of out over here. And this stuff here is actually snowdrift coming back. And out to the west, it's all that socked in cloud. Uh, sort of foam gap over this side here. And then this, the other side of the cockpit, this is the rotor queue over here. So the wind's coming from your right? Yeah, so it's going from right to left, yep. And then this is 180 degrees around the other way. And this is the bands of rotor queue out over here. Bunyan's uh, about there, I reckon, because that's the sort of uh, that sort of spot there. I think Bunyan's about over here. So yeah, this this spot here, that'd be about where the spud paddocks are. They get a good wave system set up there and climb up there. But what I was doing, what I did that day is jump, 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 jump forward. Some other shots going about further back, so you can see bands of rotor queue along there. Okay. Uh, and then just have a quick look here. So you can see here I've done a notch. Probably like taking a toe, got off, looking around a little bit, not around, oh yeah, there's the wave, yet yeah, we're climbing. And then over here I did a speed up. Oops, go the other way. So you can see here, that's, that's definitely a notch there. So then what the OI would be doing is look at that point there. My actual stat information said I got off a lot lower because I must have had a bit of a descent down, somewhere down here on tow, hit some sink and going down. And then from that point there, zzz, you know, eventually worked your way up and climbed up and high point up here, you know, see, there's thousands, you don't get to see that sort of heights too often mm -hmm. there. And this spot here you'll see, look at that land there, dead flat. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, that is like you can be mm -hmm. over the top of it. And then we'll just it's quite high, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, just a quick look, see, see the flight there I took off from here, ran a few wave systems here, mucked around here, and I thought there's some queue down the south there. So I went down there, and oh, that didn't work too well, and I was thinking, oh, shit, up here there looks like some wave bands up there, some queue over there, and I thought, that looks relatively stationary. Head up there, got around the side there, and boom, the climb, the climb rate just went nuts over here. It just went really good. It sort of five knots got better, better, better. And then jumped a few systems and mucked around with the wave over here. That's the Threadbow Valley up here. And, and then just quickly some wave photos. So th these shots have been taken by Rick Agnew. They're in South America. In the in the Andes, so rotor queue down here, mm -hmm. lenticulars above there. They get climb rates of like 30 knots in wave there. And you can be flying at V and A and still going up like a rocket. Mm -hmm. um, some other shots of there, so like the mountain there. There's the rotor. Another shot he's taken there. That's in that flying a jantar. That's a shot I took from New Zealand the day I arrived. A couple of locals did 1250 k there, they said it was a crap day and I said I'd like to see a good day. <laughs> and that's the uh, next day I went flying with Gavin, Mount Cook over here, Tasman Glacier over here, we're up over about 22,000 feet there, flying in wave. You can see out the west it's all socked in cloud over there and it's probably chucking it down with rain over there. And that's further around from the other shot that I had before, that wave length there, so we got up and was zapping along here having, having some fun. And that's at, uh, uh, flying from Bunyan again, that's the Threadbow Valley. And Threadbow's out over here, Kosciuszko's sort of out over there. You can see just the cloud disappearing there and rotor queue along here. And out to the west, you can see all that cloud just socked in over there. And on the east side, hardly any cloud. And that's, that's a classic of that example that was shown before, that um, Reichmann example. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clips a winner. <laughs> Not lifelong, but uh, mucking around. I went there with my boss. We did some work there doing some air conditioning work and uh, take a photo. <laughs> uh, there we go. Right. I'll, uh, good to have a winner in the, in the room. It's good. <laughs> okay, so any last questions for Frank? Well, that's pretty good. Check that one out. Two hundred ninety-five to one. I wonder why it does that. Yeah. <laughs> that fixed the handicap on that twenty-seven. The uh, right. I have to really thank Frank for a lot of work going into this because it, it, it is a complex um, uh, topic. Uh, cover off the auction and then the wave. And there's a lot, lot more about wave. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so if any of you are going to the, the Flinders, I certainly recommend that you have a chat to, to Frank and some of the other guys and Brian and others that have been doing a fair bit of their Brent has done a lot of the way flying up there. So it's yeah. really worth talking to those guys and just getting it. And it's when you've experienced it, it then makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes from below you look up, you've got no idea what's going on and all of a sudden you're above the cloud in the way and you think, ah, oh, now I understand. So once you've actually experienced it a couple of times, it starts to make much more sense. So, what, what, what yep. Frank's talking about. So the uh, so I'd like to uh, thank Frank greatly. I think a round of applause.